Story seven of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven The Story of Oello. Once upon a time there was a young girl who had the pretty name of Oello. I say once upon a time because I do not know when the time was, nor do I know what the place was though my story, in the main, is a true one. I do not mean that I sat by and saw Oello when she wove and when she spun. But I know that she did weave and did spin. I do not mean that I heard her speak the word I tell of, for it was many, many hundred years ago. But I do know that she must have said some such words, for I know many of the things which she did, and much of what kind of girl she was she grew up like other girls in her country she did not know how to read none of them knew how to read but she knew how to braid straw and to make fish nets and to catch fish she did not know how to spell indeed in that country they had no letters but she knew how to split open the fish she had caught how to clean them how to broil them on the coals and how to eat them neatly she had never studied the analysis of her language but she knew how to use it like a lady, that is, prettily, simply, without pretense, and always truly. She could sing her baby brother to sleep, she could tell stories to her sisters all day long, and she and they were not afraid when evening came, or when they were in any trouble, to say a prayer aloud to the good God. So they got along, although they could not analyze their language she knew no geography she could count her fingers and the stars in the southern cross she had never seen orion or the stars in the great bear or the pole star oello was very young when she married a young kinsman with whom she had grown up since they were babies nobody knows much about him but he loved her and she loved him and when morning came they were not afraid to pray to god together and when night came she asked her husband to forgive her if she had troubled him, and he asked her to forgive him. So that their worries and trials never lasted out the day, and they lived a very happy life till they were very old and died. There is a bad gap in the beginning of their history. I do not know how it happened, but the first I knew of them they had left their old home and were wandering alone on foot toward the south. Sometimes I have thought a great earthquake had wrecked their old happy home. Sometimes I have thought there was some horrid pestilence or fire. No matter what happened, something happened, so that Oello and her husband, of a hot, very hot day, were alone under a forest of laurels mixed with palms, with bright flowering orchids on them, looking like a hundred butterflies, ferns half as high as the church is, tossing over them, nettles as large as trees, and tangled vines threading through the hole. They were tired. Oh, how tired! Hungry! Oh, how hungry! And hot and footsore! I wish so we were out of this hole, said he to her, and yet I am afraid of the people we shall find when we come down to the lakeside. I do not know, said Oello, why they should want to hurt us. I do not know why they should want to, said he, but I am afraid they will hurt us. But we do not want to hurt them, said she. For my part, all I want is a shelter to live under, and I will help them take care of their children and— I will spin their flax and weave their thread and pound their corn and bake their bread. How will you tell them that you will do this? said he. I will do it, said Oello, and that will be better than telling them. But do you not just wish, said he, that you could speak five little words of their language to say to them that we come as friends and not as enemies? Oello laughed very heartily enemies said she terrible enemies who have two sticks for their weapons two old bags for their stores and cotton clothes for their armor i do not believe more than half the army will turn out against us so oello pulled out the potatoes from the ashes and found they were baked 
She took a little salt from her haversack or scrip, and told her husband that dinner would be ready if he would only bring some water. He pretended to groan, but went, and came in a few minutes with two gourds full, and they made a very merry meal. The same evening they came cautiously down on the beautiful meadowland which surrounded the lake they had seen. It is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. It was an hour before sunset, the hour, I suppose, when all countries are most beautiful. Oello and her husband came joyfully down the hill, through a little track the llamas had made toward the water, wondering at the growth of the wild grasses, and, indeed, the freshness of all the green, when they were startled by meeting a horde of the poor, naked, half-starved Indians who were just as much alarmed to meet with them. I do not think that the most stupid of them could have supposed Oello an enemy, nor her husband, for they stepped cheerfully down the path, waving boughs of fresh chincona as tokens of peace, and looked kindly and pleasantly on the poor Indians, as I believe nobody had looked on them before. There were fifty of the savages, but it was true that they were as much afraid of the two young northerners as if they had been an army. They saw them coming down the hill, with the western sun behind them, and one of the women cried out, They are children of the sun! They are children of the sun! And Oello and her husband looked so as if they had come from a better world that all the other savages believed it. But the two young people came down so kindly and quickly that the Indian women could not well run away. And when Oello caught one of the little babies up and tossed it in her arms and fondled it and made it laugh, the little girl's mother laughed too. And when they had all once laughed together, peace was made among them all, and Oello saw where the Indian women had been lying and what their poor little shelters were, and she led the way there and sat down on a log that had fallen there and called the children round her and began teaching them a funny game with a bit of crimson cord. Nothing pleases savage people or tame people more than attention to their children, and in less time than I have been telling this they were all good friends. The Indian women produced supper. Pretty poor supper it was, some fresh-water clams from the lake, some snails which Oello really shuddered at, but some bananas which were very nice, and some uloco, a root Oello had never seen before, and which she thought sickish. But she acted on her motto, I will do the best I can, she had said all along, so she ate and drank as if she had always been used to raw snails and to uloco, and made the wild women laugh by trying to imitate the names of the strange food. In a few minutes after supper the sun set. There is no twilight in that country. When the sun goes down, like battle target red, he rushes to his burning bed, dies the whole wave with ruddy light, then sinks at once, and all is night. The savage people showed the strangers a poor little booth to sleep in, and went away to their own lairs, with many prostrations, for they really thought them children of the sun. Oello and her husband laughed very heartily when they knew they were alone. Oello made him promise to go in the morning early for potatoes and oka and mushua, which are two other tubers, like potatoes, which grow there. And we will show them, said she, how to cook them for they had seen by the evening feast that the poor savage people had no knowledge of the use of fire. So early in the morning he went up a little way on the lake shore, and returned with strings of all these roots, and with another string of fish he had caught in a brook above. And when the savage people waked and came to Oello's hut, they found her and her husband just starting their fire, a feat these people had never seen before. He had cut with his copper knife a little groove in some soft palm wood, and he had fitted in it a round piece of iron wood, and round the iron wood had bound a bowstring, and while Oello held the palm wood firm, he made the iron wood fly round and round and round, till the pith of the palm smoked and smoked, and at last a flake of the pith caught fire, and then another and another 
and oello dropped other flakes upon these and blew them gently and fed them with dry leaves till they were all in a blaze the savage people looked on with wonder and terror they cried out when they saw the blaze they are children of the sun they are children of the sun and ran away oello and her husband did not know what they said and went on broiling the fish and baking the potatoes and the mashua and the oka and the uloko and when they were ready oello coaxed some of the children to come back and next their mothers came and next the men but still they said they are children of the sun and when they ate of the food that had been cooked for them they said it was the food of the immortals now in oello's home this work of making the fire from wood had been called menial work and was left to servants only but even the princes of that land were taught never to order another to do what they could not do themselves and thus it happened that the two young travellers could do it so well and thus it was that because they did what they could the savage people honoured them with such exceeding honour and because they did the work of servants they called them gods as it is written he who is greatest among you shall be your servant and this was much the story of that day and many days while her husband went off with the men taught them how he caught the fish and how they could catch huanacos oello sat in the shade with the children who were never tired of pulling at the crimson cord around her waist and at the tassels of her headdress all savage children are curious about the dress of their visitors so it was easy for oello to persuade them to go with her and pick tufts of wild cotton till they had quite a store of it and then to teach them to spin it on distaffs she made for them from laurel wood and at last to braid it and to knit it till at last one night when the men came home oello led out thirty of the children in quite a grand procession dressed all of them in pretty cotton suits they had knit for themselves instead of the filthy greasy skins they had always worn before this was a great triumph for oello but when the people would gladly have worshipped her she only said i did what i could i did what i could say no more say no more and as the year passed by she and her husband taught the poor people how if they would only plant the maize they could have all they wanted in the winter and if they planted the roots of the uloko and the oka and the mashua and the potato they would have all they needed of them how they might make long fishways for the fish and pitfalls for the llama and they learned the language of the poor people and taught them the language to which they themselves were born and year by year their homes grew neater and more cheerful and year by year the children were stronger and better and year by year the world in that part of it was more and more subdued to the will and purpose of a good god and whenever manco oello's husband was discouraged she always said we will do the best we can and always it proved that that was all that a good god wanted them to do it was from the truth and steadiness of those two people manco and oello that the great nation of peru was raised up from a horde of savages starving in the mountains to one of the most civilized and happy nations of their times unfortunately for their descendants they did not learn the use of iron or gunpowder so that the cruel spaniards swept them and theirs away but for hundreds of years they lived peacefully and happily growing more and more civilized with every year because the young oello and her husband manco had done what they could for them they did not know much but what they knew they could do they were not so far as we know skilful in talking but they were cheerful in acting they did not hide their light under a bushel they made it shine on all that came around their duties were the humblest only making a fire in the morning cleaning potatoes and cooking them spinning braiding twisting and weaving this was the best oello could do she did that and in doing it she reared an empire we can contrast her life with that of the savages around her 
As we can see a drop of blood when it falls into a cup of water, we can see how that one life swayed theirs. If she had lived among her kindred, and done at home these simple things, we should never have heard her name. But none the less would she have done them. None the less, year in and year out, century in and century out, would that sweet, loving, true, unselfish life have told in God's service, and he would have known it, though you and I, who are we, had never heard her name. Forgotten! Do not ever think that anything is forgotten. End of Story 7